My First Deer and Welcome to It by Patrick F. McManus. For a first deer, there's no habitat so lush and fine as a hunter's memory. Three decades and more of observation have convinced me that a first deer not only lives on in the memory of a hunter, but thrives there increasing in points and pounds with each passing year until at last it reaches full maturity, which is to say big enough to shade a team of Belgian draft horses in its shadow at high noon. It is a remarkable phenomenon and worthy of study. Consider the case of my friend Rich Sweeney and his first deer. I was with him when he shot the deer, and though my first impression was that Rich had killed a large jackrabbit, Closer examination revealed it to be a little spike buck. We were both only fourteen at the time and quivering with excitement over Wretch's good fortune in getting his first deer. Still, there was no question in either of our minds that what we had bagged was a spike buck, one slightly bigger than a bread box. You can imagine my surprise when scarcely a month later I overheard Wretch telling some friends that his first deer was a nice four-point buck. I mentioned to Wretch afterwards that I was amazed at how fast his deer was growing. He said he was a little surprised himself, but was pleased at with how well it was doing. He admitted that he had known all along that the deer was going to get bigger, eventually, <clears throat> although he hadn't expected it to happen so quickly. Staring off into the middle distance, a dreamy expression on his face, he told me, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someday my first deer becomes a world records trophy. I wouldn't either, I said. In fact, I'd be willing to bet on it. Not long ago, Rich and I were chattering with some, some boys down at Kelly's Bar and Grill, and the talk turned to first deer. It was disgusting. I can stand maudlin sentimentality as well as the next fella, but I have my limits. Some of those first deer had a mastery of escape routines that would have put Houdini to shame. Most of them were so smart, there was some question in my mind as to whether the hunter had bagged a deer or a road scholar. <clears throat> I wanted to ask them if they had tagged their buck or awarded it the Phi Beta Kappa Key. And big? There wasn't a deer there who couldn't have cradled a baby grand piano in its rack. Finally, it was Wretch's turn. And between waves of nausea, I wondered whether that little spike buck had developed enough over the years to meet this kind of competition. I needn't have wondered. Wretch's deer no longer walked in typical deer fashion. It ghosted about through the trees like an apparition. When it galloped, through, when it galloped though the sound was like thunder rolling through the hills, and so help me, fire flickered in its eyes. Its tracks looked like they had been excavated with a backhoe. They were that big. And smart? That deer could have taught field tactics at West Point. Wretch's little spike buck had come a long way, baby. At last, Wretch reached the climax of his story. I don't expect you boys to believe this, he said, his voice hushed with reverence. But when I dropped that deer, the mountain trembled. The boys all nodded, believing. Why, hadn't the mountain trembled for them, too, when they shot their first deer? Of course it had. All first deer are like that. Except mine. I banged the table for attention. Now, I said, I'm going to tell you about a real first deer. Not a figment of my senility, not some fossilized hope of my gangling adolescence, but a real first deer. Now, I could tell from looking at their stunned faces that the boys were upset. There is nothing that angers the participants of a bull session more than someone who refuses to engage in the mutual exchange of illusions. Someone who tells the simple truth, unstretched, unvarnished, unembellished, and whole. Even though it violates the code of true sportsmanship, I began, I must confess that I still harbor unkind thoughts for my first deer. True to his form, and unlike almost other first deer, he has steadfastly refused to grow in either my memory or imagination. He simply stands there in original size and puny rack, peering over the lip of my consciousness, an insolent smirk decorating his pointy face. Here I offered that thankless creature escape from the anonymity of becoming someone else's second or seventh or seventeenth deer, or at very least from an 
old age presided over by coyotes. And how did he repay me? With humiliation. The boys at Kelly's bar shrank back in horror at this heresy. Wretch Sweeney tried to slip away, but I riveted him to his chair with a maniacal laugh. His eyes pleaded with me, No, don't tell us. They said, Don't destroy the myth of the first deer, which is pretty long speech for a couple of beady bloodshot eyes. Unrelenting and with only an occasional pause for a bitter sardonic cackle to escape my foam-flecked lips, I plunged on with the tale, stripping away layer after layer of myth, and until last the truth about one man's first deer had been disrobed and lay before them in all its grim and naked majesty, shivering and covering with goosebumps. I began by pointing out what I considered to be one of the great bureau uh, bureaucratic absurdities of all times, that a boy at age 14 was allowed to purchase his first hunting license and deer tag but was prevented from obtaining a driver's license until he was 16. This was like telling a kid he could go swimming, but to stay away from the water. Did the bureaucrats think that trophy mule deer came down from the hills in the evening to drink out of your garden hose? The predicament left you no recourse but to beg the adult hunters you knew to take, your hunting, to take you hunting with them on weekends. My problem was that all the hunters I knew bagged their deer in the first couple of weeks of the season, and from then on I had to furnish my own transportation. This meant that in order to get up to the top of the mountain where the trophy mule deer hung out, I had to start out at four in the morning if I wanted to be there by noon. I remember one time when I was steering around some big boulders in the road, about three quarters of the way up the Dawson grade, and a jeep with two hunters in it came plowing up behind me. I pulled over so they could pass. These hunters grinned at me as they went by. You'd think they'd never before seen anyone pedaling a bike 20 miles up the side of a mountain to go deer hunting. I had rigged up my bike especially for deer hunting. There were straps to hold my rifle snugly across the handlebars, and saddlebags draped over the back fender to carry my gear. The back fender had been reinforced to support a sturdy platform, my reason for this being that I didn't believe the original fender was stout enough to support a buck when I got one. My one oversight was failing to put a guard over the top of the bike chain, in which I had to worry constantly about getting my tongue caught. Deer hunting on a bike was no picnic. <clears throat> a mile farther on, and a couple of hours later, I came to where the fellows in the jeep were busy setting up camp with some other hunters. Apparently someone told a fantastic joke just as I went pumping by because they all collapsed in a fit of laughter and were doubled over and rolling on the ground and pounding trees with their fists. They seemed like a bunch of lunatics to me, and I hoped they didn't plan on hunting in the same area I was headed for. I couldn't wait to see their faces when I came coasting easily back down the mountain with the trophy buck draped over the back of my bike. One of the main problems with biking your way up to, a, to hunt deer was that if you left at four in the morning, by the time you got to the hunting place, there were only a couple of hours of daylight left in which to do your hunting. Then you had to spend some time resting, at least until the pounding of your heart eased up enough not to frighten the deer. As luck would have it, just as I was unstrapping my rifle from the handlebars, a buck mule deer came dancing out of the brush not twenty yards away from me. Now right then I should have known he was up to no good. He had doubtless been lying on a ledge and watching me for hours as I pumped my way up the mountain. He had probably even snickered to himself as he plotted ways to embarrass me. All the time I was easing the rifle loose from the handlebars, digging a shell out of my pocket, and thumbing it into the rifle, the deer danced and clowned and cut up all around me, smirking the whole time. The instant I jacked the shell into the chamber, however, he stepped behind a tree. I darted to one side, rifle at the ready. He moved to the other side of the tree and stuck his head out just enough so I could see him feigning a yawn. As I moved up close to the tree, he did a rapid tiptoe to another tree. I heard him snort with laughter. For a whole hour he toyed with me in this manner, enjoying himself immensely. Then I fooled him, or at least so I thought at the time. I turned and started walking in a dejected manner back toward my bike, still watching his hiding place out the corner of my eye. 
He stuck his head out to see what I was up to. I stepped behind a small bush and knelt as if to tie my shoe. Then swiftly I turned, drew a bead on his head, and fired. Down he went. I was still congratulating myself on a fine shot when I rushed up to his crumpled form. Strangely, I could not detect a bolt hole in his head, but one of his antlers was chipped, and I figured the slug had struck him there with sufficient force to do him in. No matter, I said to myself. I had at least got my first deer, and I pictured in my mind the joyous welcome I would receive when I came home hauling in a hundred or so pounds of venison. Then I discovered my knife had fallen out of its sheath during my frantic pursuit of the deer. Instant anguish. The question that nagged my waking moments for years afterwards was, did the deer know that I had dropped my knife? Had I only interpreted it correctly? The answer to that question was written all over the buck's face. He was still wearing that stupid smirk. Well, I told myself, what I'll do is just load him on my bike, haul him down to the lunatic hunter's camp, and borrow a knife from them to dress him out with. I thought this plan particularly good and that it would offer me the opportunity to give those smart alecks a few tips on deer hunting. Loading the buck on the bike was much more of a problem than I had expected. When I draped him crosswise over the platform on the rear fender, his head and front quarters dragged on one side and he was rear quarters on the other. Several times as I lift and pulled and hauled, I thought I heard a giggle, but when I looked around, nobody was there. It was during one of these pauses that a brilliant idea occurred to me. With Herculean effort, I managed to arrange the deer so that he was sitting a straddle of the platform, his forelegs splayed out forward and his head drooping down. I lashed his front feet, feet to the handlebars, one on each side. Then I slid onto the seat ahead of him, draped his head over my shoulder, and pushed off. I ad must admit that riding a bike with a deer on behind was good more difficult than I had anticipated. Even though I pressed down on the brake for all I was worth, our wobbling descent was much faster than I would have liked. The road was narrow, twisting, and filled with ruts and large rocks, with brake-taking drop-offs at the outer edge. When one came hurtling around a sharp, high bend above the hunter's camp, oh, sorry, when we came hurtling around a sharp, high bend above the hunter's camp, I glanced down. Even from that distance, I could see their eyes pop out and their jaws sag as they caught sight of us. What worried me most was the hill that led down to the hunter's camp. As we arrived at the crest of it, my heart, liver, and kidneys all jumped in unison. The hill was much steeper than I had remembered. It was at that point that the buck gave a loud, startled snort. My first deer had either just regained consciousness or been shocked out of his pretense of death at the sight of the plummeting grade before us. We both tried to leap free of the bike, but he was tied on and I was locked in the embrace of his front legs. When we shot past the hunter's camp, I was too occupied at that moment to get a good look at their faces. I heard afterwards that a game warden found them several hours later frozen in various postures and still staring at the road in front of their camp. The report was probably exaggerated. However, game wardens being little better than hunters at sticking to the simple truth. I probably would have been able to get the bike stopped sooner and with fewer injuries to myself if I had had enough sense to tie down the deer's hind legs. As it was, he started flailing wildly about with them and somehow managed to get his hooves on the pedals. By the time we reached the bottom of the mountain, he not only had the hang of pedaling, but was showing considerable talent for it. He also seemed to be enjoying himself immensely. We zoomed up and down over the rolling foothills and into the bottomlands with the deer pedaling wildly and me shouting and cursing and trying to wrest control of the bike from him. At last, he, at last he piled us up in the middle of a farmer's pumpkin patch. He tore himself loose from the bike and bounded into the woods all the while making obscene gestures at me with his tail. I threw the rifle to my shoulder and got off one quick shot. It might have hit him, too, if the bike hadn't been still strapped to the rifle. <laughs> now that, I said to the boys at Kelly's bar, 
is how to tell about a first year. A straightforward, factual report unadorned by a lot of lies and sentimentality. Unrepented, they muttered angrily. To soothe their injured feelings, I told them about my second year. It was so big it could cradle a baby grand piano in its rack and shade a team of Belgian draft horses in its shadow at high noon. Honest, I wouldn't lie about a thing like that. 